want to talk about is prioritizing God confidence over self confidence. And where this comes from is last weekend when I was in Edmonton, there was this fellow came up to me afterwards and said, Would you pray for me? I said, well, Sure. Why? He said, Because I have no self confidence, none. And I thought, Wow, you're blessed. And he thought, You're crazy. I'm asking you to pray because I want self confidence. I said, I, but, but, but I thought, and I, and I told him, You know, you don't know how blessed you are. Because for a lot of people, that's their biggest obstacle, is their self-confidence. Because self-confidence won't change the world. God confidence. And we have to learn what's the difference. I'm going to hopefully try to share this with you. But then I want you to understand that if you're at the place in your life where you don't feel confident in whatever area, count yourself blessed. Because when you find out what God says, you don't have a choice. The people that aren't so, it's, they, they have the choice. Like, I could do it on my own. I could do it my way. You know, that's the famous theme song of hell. I did it my way. It doesn't work. We can actually begin to believe and understand this changes the world. This, God's word, changes the world. Not your word, not my word, not our prime minister's word, not the president of the United States' word, God's word. God confidence is where our confidence is rooted in God, in his word. Self-confidence is everything else. It's everything else. Self-confidence is where our confidence is rooted in what we understand, what we can figure out. What does the media say? What does the crowd say? What's the normal? What does the you know, stats say? I've just got all the information. I'm getting everything from every which way, and that's what's giving me confidence. No, that's self-confidence. God confidence is rooted in one thing and one thing only. What does God say? And we need to recognize it's, it's, it's world-changing. But it's not something you can learn. It's something you actually get on the inside of you, and it changes. Think of the word confidence. Confidence is a really important word. It, the actual definition of it is to have full trust or reliance on. Most of us would think right away, if you know the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There's a difference right there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The trust in the Lord with all your heart, confidence, is the belief that something will succeed before you get there. That's what confidence is. And we, it's so important in our world. You know, you, you know when, you need, when you meet somebody new and, and, and they're confident, your confidence in them rises, doesn't it? It makes a difference in our world. But our confidence needs to be on a whole nother level. Because it's really not about what we think. It's not about how, how we can figure it out. What does God's word say? And we think of confidence, it actually can be translated into the word faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. You can have faith in yourself. You know that? You can have faith in the government. You can have faith in, in medicine. You can have faith in your education. There's all kinds of things we can have faith in. And it's not bad to understand those things. But the bottom line of our life is we need to have faith in God. Amen? I want you to change your world. You know... The scripture that you talked about, Jackie, in 2 Kings, where Elisha says to his servant, you don't see what I see. And then he prays and says, God opened his eyes. And, you know, God opened Elisha's eyes and he saw the, the hills were covered with, with the chariots of fire, right? I've, I've, I, I love that story. But do you know for... I think for some Christians, this might be an exaggeration, but if God opened your eyes, you'd see one big, fat, lazy angel. Why? 
Because angels actually are called to serve you and I. Do you know that? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Psalms 103, verse 20. It says, angels hearken, listen, to the voice of the word of God. I don't know if you know this, but you can listen to this all day. It's not going to say anything. It's a book. But when this gets inside of you, and you and I begin to speak, it's called God confidence. And as we begin to speak, angels are hearkening under the voice of the word of God. And, and, and Elisha was speaking the word all the time. That's why the hills were covered. We don't understand how important we are in this world. And I'm going to talk about a story of someone that didn't know who, they, who he was. And I think one of the biggest problems we all have is identity. We don't understand our, our identity. God confidence is the confidence of God in us. Not the confidence of God out there. A lot of us are praying that God would come down and do this. God would change this. God would, would change that. He's already done it. What he's going to do? He so loved the world that he sent his son 2,000 years ago. It's done. It's history. Jesus came, lived, served, died on a cross for us, rose again, and he's alive forevermore. And he said, if you would open your heart and invite me, I will come into your heart. I'll make my home in your heart. You will be born again. All things will pass away. All things will become brand new. You'll become a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's who we are. He's in us. And God confidence is kind of a weird confidence because it is a confidence in yourself, but not the self that's you by yourself. The self that he's in you, that self. When we know who we are in Christ, by him, through him, in him, there's a confidence that rises up on the inside of us. And that's really what I want to, I, I can't share this loud enough or sharp enough. Do you know the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing between the soul and the spirit, the joints and marrow, the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, the joints and marrow. Do you know what, who serves who there, the joints of the marrow? The marrow is what actually serves and builds the bone, builds the joints. And the marrow talks about our spirit. And we live in a world that we're so, I, I think we're so caught up in what, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and all of the, you know, those good things. And that's okay. But more importantly is what does the Spirit of God say? The Word and the Spirit are one. His Word by His Spirit in us needs to come out of us, through us. Listen to this. Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus, so some of you know the story. Jesus is walking along and He sees a... a a fig tree that hasn't produced, and, and he, he curses the tree. They come back the next day, and the tree, tree is withered and, 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 and dead. And, and Peter, John, and Spot said, what, what, how, how, how'd that happen? And Jesus explains. He says, have faith in God. Not in the numbers. Not in the crowd. Not in the education. If you have, you have faith in education, it's okay to understand and believe things, need to learn things. But have faith in God. God wants that to be our bottom line. Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says, listen to this, says to this mountain. When's the last time you talked to a mountain? I'm not talking about Mount Seymour either. I'm talking about mountains in your life, which are challenges in your life. You know, God wants you to overcome challenges. He's called you to be an overcomer. And we don't overcome challenges by enduring, by maintaining, by getting by. We're called to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. It's what's happening in here when you get the word of God in here, when it gets in here so rich and you know it, that you know it, that you know it, that you know it. 
What comes out of here is his word. I think our world today is literally dying to hear the word of God. We could print more Bibles. It won't change the world. We could do more TV shows, lots of different things. It won't change the world. You know the only thing that changed the world? God's word. But it's his word that comes out of us. It says, you don't doubt in your heart, but believe that those things he says, he says, will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I think too many times we just talk to God about the mountain. We talk to God about the challenges. We talk to God about your family. Talk to God about your health. Talk to God about your, your world. Talk to God about your challenges. And, and, and God's got an open ear and he loves us. But he wants you to listen. What does he say? And then talk to your mountain. Talk to your mountain. I was talking to one of the sisters and she was saying how her life has been caught up in fear. And I know what that's like. I wrote a book about it years ago. Because I had this fear of speaking. Are you listening to me? I'm speaking. I love speaking when I had a fear of speaking. Because I feel like it's kicking the devil right where it hurts. And I would pray that you would kick him a lot. And the only way you do that is by overcoming. And you overcome by what does the word say? I don't know how many times I looked in the mirror and I talked to that guy. Sometimes your mountain is in the mirror. I wouldn't say sometimes. I'd say a lot of times. Your mountain is in the mirror. Well, I don't feel that way. Well, I, I've, I've, I kind of... I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to do that. Well, I don't feel confident about that. Do you know what confidence is in the New Testament? It was boldness. Boldness. You don't see boldness in the, in the face of everything's going good. I'm really bold because we've got the biggest army and we've got the greatest education and we've got the greatest government and we've got the greatest... That doesn't make you bold. What makes you bold is when you don't have all that stuff and you stand up. Like Peter and John, when they came, came out of the, the day of Pentecost, and, and, and it, 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 what, what, where, where, where you been? People could see the difference, okay? And God's no respecter of persons. You and I, we are the Peter and John, the apostles, the, 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 you know, the disciples of today. And our world literally is dying to hear that kind of boldness, which is that kind of confidence, which is the word of God that we speak. When's the last time you talked to your mountain? Whatever your mountain is, find out what God says. And then stand up. Don't, don't just put up. So often we just put up. We, we, we think the answer is just to, to, to survive. It's never to survive. Never. It's to thrive. Compromise is you put up with what you don't believe because you're not willing to fight the fight and pay the price that you do believe. Don't compromise. What we compromise to keep, we're going to lose. You just need to understand we have the Spirit of God. We have the Word of God. I'm a brand new creation in Christ. His word is working mightily in me. I'm not praying for a natural life. I'm already living a supernatural life. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven. I can live it right now and make a difference right now. A lot of people think it's all about you know, when you die and go to heaven. That's what it's all about. No, it isn't. If that was what it's all about, you've heard me say this below, you know, before. If that is, was, all that, what it's all about, when you get baptized, we just put you under and keep you there. <laughs> until the bubbles stop. And then you go to heaven. 
But that's not what it's about. Come on, church, we're here. We're here. You're, you're one of the few, okay? I don't know if you know this, but, but the, the, there's a wide path and there's a narrow path. And you're one of the few. And you need to get it. Get it inside of you. Get some fight on the inside of you. I'm going to try and get through this because I'm taking way too long. Our confidence needs to be rooted in what God says over everything else. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not moved by what everybody says. I'm not moved by the crowds. I'm not moved by the numbers. I'm not moved by the government. I'm only moved by what his word says. I'm only moved by what your word says, God. Paul said this, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What is he talking about? When my self-confidence is low and I know what God says, I get really excited. When my self-confidence is low, but I know what God says, mm, I'm really excited. Because usually that's when God does crazy miracles. And in comparison to God confidence, all of us might as well throw your self-confidence away. And in comparison, his is so strong. I want to look at the story of Gideon. The story of Gideon is a great story. If you haven't read about it, it's in, it's in Judges chapter 6 and chapter 7. And the Israelites were being beat up on by the Midianites around them and other countries from the east. And, and these other countries would come, every, especially when it was harvest time, and just destroy their harvest, kill all their livestock. And, 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 and for seven years, they were starving. And here Gideon, he was a judge, and he was, in Judges chapter 6, um, he was in the wine press, in a wine press. You know what a wine press is for? Pressing wine. <laughs> Which is, you got all the grapes, in, and you, you stomp on the grapes, and the juices come out and run, and, the, and that's what's collected. They make wine out of that. Usually it's in a pit that they, they dug into the ground, or it's in a big vat, and, and he's in it because he's hiding. He's in the wine press hiding from the Midianites, but he's not pressing wine. He's threshing wheat. <laughs> now, if you know what threshing wheat is, that's where, you know, they take the wheat and they, they crush it all up, but then they take it and throw it in the air so that the wind would blow the chaff away and they'd have the, the, the good stuff left. Well, there's no wind in a wine press. There's no wind in a hole. There's no wind in a vat. It doesn't work very well. So he's not, you know, it's not working very well. And a lot of times we, we kind of think, well, that, we make fun of him. But this is what I think. At least he was doing something. At least he was doing something. There's a lot of us, when it doesn't look like anything's going to work, what do we do? Nothing. At least he was doing something with what he had. And it wasn't, wasn't really the best but it was what he thought was the best. He thought all it was, maybe. And in that moment, the angel of the Lord shows up. <laughs> and I love this, because in what moment? In the moment where he's hiding. In the moment where he's doing the best he could with what he has, the angel of the Lord shows up. So you, you can hide from the enemy, but you can't hide from God. And often what, when, when, when he really wants to get a hold of your attention is when you're hiding from the enemy. You ever been hiding? I have. <laughs> ever been hiding? God shows up. And, and in that moment, he says to Gideon something so important. Because the first thing he says is, as I think really in encouraging for all of us, it's the first thing we need to hear. He says to Gideon who he is. He identifies Gideon. Gideon is afraid. He's in the, the wine press hiding from the enemy. And the Spirit of God or the, the angel of the Lord shows up in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. He says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Who? Who are you talking to? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I'm hiding. How can I be a mighty man of valor? He didn't know who he was. I think many of us we don't know who we are. And when you're least expecting, when you're sometimes hiding, when you're running, listen, God can show up and, and give you what you need to hear, which is identify who you are. And then 
The part I want to get to, because actually there's so many miraculous stories that go on right there. Um, so Gideon um, tests the Lord, figures it out that he's called by God, is used by God. And later on, the enemy is again um, poised to come and to, to ruin all their crops as they get ready for their their harvest again and and take and kill all their livestock and the angel of the lord shows up to gideon and it's this is this is when the story starts and he told gideon to blow the trumpet call the army together so gideon blows the trumpet and the army comes together and they've got 32,000 which in comparison to the enemy is not very many it's like, this is not, not good news. But God says, hold it, hold it, 32,000, that's too many. <laughs> if or when you succeed, when, when I help you and you win the battle, the temptation is for you to think it was because of your 32,000. The temptation is for you to think it's because of your education. The temptation is to think because you're such a, a nice person, a funny person, a, um, you know, everybody loves you. I don't know what it is, but your temptation is to look at self-confidence over God-confidence. So God says, well, just, just, just go talk to the, all of them. And any of them that have any fear, that are afraid of what's going on, tell them they can go home. So out of 32,000, 22. Catch you later. <laughs> this is not for me. He's got 10,000 left. And still 10,000 seems like that is crazy. They're, you're never going to be able to defeat the Midianites. Was as they say it as many as the sand on the seashore. Like, you know, covered the mountains. You can't defeat them with, with 10,000. But God says still too many. Still might look like it's you. Still you might not get it. That God is stronger, is mightier in every situation. God doesn't need multitudes. He doesn't need you to have a lot. Sometimes we think when we have many people on our side, we have a majority. No, uh, uh, uh. if you don't have God, you don't have a majority. Because a majority is any one of us with God. God and you make a majority. And so God tells them, listen, I want to just winnow it down a little bit more, take them down to the water and test them. So they take them down to the water for a drink. And what happens is 300 out of the 10,000, they, they go down to the water and they drink like this. What am I doing? I'm looking. I'm watching. 300 of them were watching their circumstances, walked, watching the world around them. And the other ones went down like, like a dog would do and just drink out of the ground and can't see anything. And those ones went home. So they ended up with only 300. And this is interesting because now Gideon's down to 300. This is going to take some faith. <laughs> this is like all odds, all bets are off. God doesn't show up. This is crazy. And so God says, if you still have a problem or if you still have a little bit of a doubt, um, why don't you take someone and sneak up on your enemy and listen? <laughs> so Gideon takes his servant and they sneak up on the Midianites and they're listening. And let, let me read it to you. Judges chapter 7, verse 13. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream. To his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon. Oh, that's where it got my attention. Hold it. What, 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 what? He interpreted this dream as this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian in the whole camp. It's interesting that his words were the sword of Gideon. Because we would think it's the sword of the Lord. 
You know what the sword of the Lord is? It's the word of the Lord. The Bible teaches that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. So what's the sword of Gideon? It's the word of Gideon. That's what's interesting to me. And so he gets back and, and he, his confidence is now, I know this is God, this is a miracle, this is amazing. And we think of often in our lives, um, there's things that God can't do. Like there's people in our world that God can't reach. Think again. He takes great joy in doing things that aren't possible. God loves the impossible because with God, nothing is impossible. And I love that line. With God, nothing is impossible. Do you know what's impossible with God? Nothing. <laughs> In other words, if you pray, if you put it before God and you think nothing's happened, that's impossible. Sometimes we don't see it right now. Sometimes we don't even see it in our lifetime. But for nothing to happen, impossible. Impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And here in the enemy camp, God gets a hold of someone and it just coincidentally happened when he snuck into the camp that he hear, heard this guy. No, no, there's no coincidences. Heard, heard this guy and he had a dream. And do you know the Holy Spirit actually speaks by dreams and visions? New Testament talks about that. But not just dreams and visions to us. God's not limited. So here the enemy has this dream and they in front of, of him interpret the dream and it's the sword of Gideon. So anyway, Gideon gravels, you know, grabs his troops together, 300 of them, and he gives them all a, uh, a lamp and a trumpet, and he sends them to the mountains around that's surrounding the camp of, of Midian, and here's what happened. They held the torches in their left hand, and the trumpets in their right hands were blowing, and they cried, and they cried. What did they cry? The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. What happened was the enemy destroyed itself. But again, they cried out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God wants our confidence to be in God through us. Not in God out there, God in here. And if you're not yet a born-again Christian, today, Jesus died, rose again. He's alive, he's here by his spirit. He says, if you open your heart, you believe in your heart, you invite him, he'd come into your heart, he'd make his home in, in your heart, and you know what, you're a brand new creation. All things pass away, all things become brand new. You don't have to pray that God out there would come and do something. He's in here. And God will lead you in here. Our world's dying for the Word of God, to hear the Word of God. And it's only going to come out of us. And when it comes out of you, it's called the sword. How's your sword? How sharp? When's the last time you spoke to your mountain? Are you speaking, hoping, or knowing? That's the difference. I can't tell you how important this is. Don't be moved by the crowds. Don't be moved by everything else that people look to. All that stuff's okay but you should only be moved by one thing. What does God say? What does God say? And when you know what God says, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Period. Done. Finished. His word coming out of our mouth by His Spirit 
is miraculous. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come just so that we would go to heaven. Like I said, when you get baptized, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're going to take you back up out of the water. He came so you could change the world. But your words won't change the world. His word coming out of your mouth will change the world. And you don't have to speak in King James English. You just got to know that you know that you know that you know. Jesus paid the price. It's done. It's done. Talk to that mountain. Fear, I command you in Jesus' name. You know, when I was a dentist, they would send me all the fear cases. I was a dentist in Williams Lake, and, and they, all the dentists, there was, I don't know, there was probably nine of us, they would, all of them would send me the patients that were, and there's a lot of them when you come to a dentist that are paranoid with fear. I never once gave them general anesthetic, nitrous oxide, nothing. You know what I did? I spoke to that fear. And it, every single time it worked. I remember one time I had a, the, Canadian arm, the Canadian arm wrestling champion in my chair. I mean, he was big. And as I tipped him back in the chair, he pretty well almost broke my, my, my armchair things, you know? Because he went back and, he, and, and they went back with him. <laughs> and I just sort of laughed at him. I rolled my chair back and laughed at him. And I said, you're, you're full of fear. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, did, did you know that fear is a spirit? The Bible says God's not given you the spirit of fear. Do you know that I'm a Christian and greater is he that's in me than he that's in you? And if you would let me, I'll pray. I'll speak to that spirit, and, and, and he will leave. Is that okay? I've never had one ever say no. Every single time. They're very, very aware of that spirit. And all I would do is just speak. I, I wouldn't say, God, please heal. God, please. No, I'd say, in the name of Jesus, spirit of fear, leave. <laughs> kind of comes on me, you know. I can't really control myself because there's this, there's this fight on the inside of me. But what happened over and over again is it, it was it. Like, what happened? And, and I used to, you know, on average would lead a person a day to the Lord in my dental clinic. How? Often that was how, right there. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. You're a Christian. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm not moved by what I feel, what I think, what I, what's, what's around me. I'm moved by what his word is. His word is working mightily in me. Great is his word. Great mighty is it in us. We can change the world. So three things in summation. Number one, three things we learned from Gideon. Number one, God sees and calls out the greatness in you even when you're hiding. Wow. Don't judge yourself just because you're hiding. No, he's bigger. God sees and calls out the greatness in you even when you're hiding. Number two, God wants your confidence to be in him through you. Not just in him. In him through you. He's in you. Know who you are. And number three, God confidence shines brighter when our self-confidence is lowest. So if you're not feeling very confident, hooray, yay, awesome, because his confidence is greater. You don't have to be feeling self-confident low but just know that your low feeling does not limit him. When the world out there looks darker, he's brighter. And you can change your world. God confidence, prioritize it over all else, self-confidence. Amen.